Hello and welcome to 20 Lore Pro. We're here today at Game Castle in Austin for their Lorcana 1K here in round four. Very excited to be here today. We're watching Jeremy piloting a Ruby Sapphire list versus Aaron Rubin, aka Lorcana Bro, a regular here on the channel piloting a Emerald Steel list. Very excited to be here. I'm one of your announcers today, Sir Ashtown, and joining with me today is Liam from the Illumiteers here for round four, special guest. How you doing, Liam? Hey, Wesley, I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for letting me uh, chip in for this match. Um, I, I, Yeah, anytime I get to stream with you, it's, it's a joy. Well, it's good to see you and your family and really just kind of catching up here in Austin. It's uh, always great to come down here and to kind of be here at Game Castle. It's a great store, great community, and glad to come here and to watch some Lorcana today. Yeah, no, it's it's wonderful. And, you know, one of the things I love about these local tournaments, especially these local tournaments here at Game Castle, is um, you, a lot of people are used to watching these Disney Lorcana Challenge streams or these big tournaments like Charlie's. And, and at those tournaments, you have the best players bringing some of like the top meta decks. And at these local tournaments, sometimes we get to see these weird, fun, diverse metas with some decks that you wouldn't necessarily see in those big tournaments. Here, for example, you have Aaron piloting an Emerald Steel deck, which is not one of the top meta decks right now, but he's probably testing it out and trying to get it ready, perhaps for Vegas. Um, who knows if he'll run this or not, but um, it's definitely fun to see in these local tournaments some, some fun cards that you might not see in some of these big tournaments. That's something that I was kind of commenting on earlier was that even though this is a locals, it is a 1K, you still might see something that's off meta that you might think, you know what? I didn't think about playing that. I maybe need to test that out or at least be prepared to maybe test a couple of games against it so I'm aware of how to play around it. And we saw in, I believe, round two, a player who was piloting a Ruby Amber list and he played four of nine drop Gastons, the 10th no. stick, and he brought it out turn four. And it was scary. I can't wait to go back and watch that. That's fantastic. So there are some uh, options out there that uh, we may not see very often outside of those matches like that. Yeah, this is, and speaking of fun matchups, this is a this is a really fun one. You know, we have this Ruby Sapphire deck has been around for the last few sets. I hear there's a lot of it here today. Um, I don't know if you've been seeing a lot of it here. Yes, we have. I, I think we've seen, I think twice here on the feature match. And... I see a bunch of players playing it around. It's got a lot of options. We've seen some that focus more on the Ice Block Sisu package and others focusing more on just the straight items into Tamatoa. So it's fun to see the variance, but there is a lot of it here today. Mm, that's true. And I'm not surprised. This is a deck that's been very good for the last few sets. And it got a lot of new tools here in set four that people are toying around with. You know, you have cards like Chicha and Tipo, um, and then even Visions of the Future, which I know some very good players have said is low-key one of the best cards in this set. So I'm not surprised we see it super popular. Um, and then here, here we have Aaron, as we said, bringing in an Emerald Steel deck, which is a deck we know was super popular last set when Bucky was around. And now that he's gone, I think it's become, dropped way out of the top four or even five decks uh, in the meta. But fun to see it played here. Um, it did get a few, still got a, a few fun new tools. Uh, for example, we have this Pete here, which will prevent playing any actions. And that's what Aaron used to kind of seal the deal. Jeremy did have a couple outs uh, here. The biggest one being be prepared, which would have cleared the board. But playing that Pete right there means that uh, that wasn't a possibility. So uh, what a fun way to, I don't know, close down the game. Yeah, that's something that is, we've seen some of the Ruby list trying to figure out how can I get around when Steel players play their Pete because they can't play their Be Prepared right after a P comes out. So some of them have opted, opted to start trying to look at options like Scar, just having something else to try to just get in and, and try to challenge the board when they know they can't Be Prepared. Because Pete is just such a strong option to really prevent your opponent from completely clearing you out and taking you out of the game. There's also this new in Emerald Steel. We've kind of been seeing this a little bit more now that we're here in Set 5, but this Clarabelle. And I mean, this oh, card yes. is doing work. Oh, yes. One of the most popular cards. One of the most expensive cards. Um, <laughs> so many ways to, ways to make it work. And uh, yeah, when this Clarabelle is working for you, it really, really, I mean, that's just good. It's good. Not only that, but, you know, Floodborne cards and expensive cards are... Uh, Oftentimes they have good abilities, they're, they're great. Um, but if you have good targets for them, it makes them even better. And a good uh, shift target for these are cards that 
Um, not only are they are they obviously cheaper, you can get them on the board earlier, preferably in turns one or two to have that option out there. But then also they do something for you. Um, so not they're not in there just as a shift target, but they're in there uh, to provide you, or they can do something else for you, even if you're not using the shift. And Clarabelle's shift target, uh, the one cost clumsy goat, um, allows you to banish items. Um, and so that's great because it's a card now that is versatile. It, it serves two functions for you. One, it's a shift target you can get in play early. But two, um, in a pinch, you can use it to banish your opponent's items, which are key cogs in the engine that a lot of decks nowadays are trying to build. You know, talking about shift options and them being viable, I love the Clarabelle. has great ability, like you were saying, Liam. But I've seen some of these Emerald Steel lists even sneaking in some morphs. <laughs> Just something like we saw Aaron here playing Beast. It can get out your Beast very early, and that is uh, pretty scary to see. Morph is such an interesting card because he he doesn't do a lot for you on his own, but you're, you're right that he introduces this uncertainty because in these Emerald Steel lists, there's so many good Floodborne. Not only the Beast you mentioned, and then of course we have the Clarabelle now, but you also have Diablo who can shift onto it. And then you also have um, Robin Hood, Champion of Sherwood, uh, which is another great Floodborne. And so when you're sitting there with Morph, your opponent has to factor in that you could have any of those in your hand and has to play around them all, which is tricky. Well, Speaking here, of Diablo, here he comes. Diablo, there he is. This is uh, going off here with Aaron really sticking to the game strategy of Emerald Steel here, Steel here with this Diablo, trying to draw some cards and really gain that advantage over his opponent Jeremy here on turn two. Yeah, the, the shift into Diablo to immediately sing a removal song is something that we saw over and over again last set. Um, any any Emerald Steel deck loves to play that. Luckily for Jeremy, he has the answer to Diablo to keep it from uh, giving Aaron that card advantage for the next few turns. Brawling it there, getting it off the board, but we see Aaron immediately play another Diablo. Uh, but since it's not shifted, it's going to take it a turn to get online. This is scary too, with having this Mr. Smee, 3-3 three, three body, able to quest for two, You've already given an answer over to one of the Diablos. He has another one and then is able to quest for two and is going to keep able to doing it. And that's kind of where Aaron wants to be right here, drawing cards, getting resources, while also continuing to gain lore. Jeremy here having that Flavor Sham, no item, I believe, to target on the ETB. We'll see if he can't find one here to maybe do it on the quest. Aaron here singing... Uh... Let the storm rage on, putting two damage on that Flavisham. Uh, gets him a card, uh, probably drawing for an answer. Would love to get that Flavisham off the board, but again, luckily, uh, no item to target yet. Although we do get a peek at Jeremy's hand there. We see an ice block um, that he could he could eat pretty quickly if he wanted to. It's not quite as good as a popsicle, but it's not quite as bad tasting as a Fortisphere. So um, <laughs> not a terrible option for Flavisham to munch down on there. Unfortunately, I'm um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, and now he knows kind of what to look out for and is able to either commit to the board, like Aaron, we see him doing here now, or hold back. But seeing those cards in Jeremy's hands, he commits to the board and continues to build his state. Well, here's the challenge here for Jeremy. Jeremy, at this point in the mid game, uh, wants to get a Flavisham online. Anytime you have four ink on the board, that's what this deck is trying to do, is trying to build its way into the end game, draw into the answers, ramp. Um, but with that Diablo online and with no removal in hand, uh, Jeremy has to make a decision about you know eating this ice block here with Flavisham. Uh, you want to draw into your answers, but you don't want to give Aaron two cards as well. So any drawing hit at this point that Jeremy is going to do, um, you know, is going to set Aaron up. I I do think though, as you suggested, committing to the board and going wide. Uh, Aaron now has six lore on board. He's got that Diablo, which is going to draw him cards. Um, so Jeremy's play here, I think, is to draw into a be prepared, you know, as fast as possible, try to reset the board. Um, and he did draw into a Sisu there. That is great. Um, so although Aaron got two cards, I think that that play worked out very well for Jeremy. Um, got another body on the board and got rid of that Diablo, which was going to give Aaron so much card advantage. And we're going to see this Sisu, Sisu kind of shine here with the ice block because able to reduce that Diablo by one and then getting rid of it with the Sisu. The Sisu's got evasive. It could always challenge into another Diablo if that happens again, which would be the third Diablo for Aaron. But also now really represents a great shift target with that ice block already ready on board for that big Sisu to hit the board and make a big splash. Let's see Aaron here exerting five. There's that Robin Hood Champion of Sherwood. Uh, great card. Not only is it a uh, 
big body, but uh, it draws a card when it's banished in challenge, and also uh, it can gain you two lore when it challenges. Um, probably not the ideal turn five card here, and probably would have liked to have a Beast Tragic Hero here, but gets another big body on the board, uh, something that is immune to that Sisu, uh, unless there's an Ice Block in play, and just continuing to build his board state here. I think at this point, Aaron is just driving his lore. He's looking for a four lore turn if he can get it, um, really putting the pressure on Jeremy. Jeremy now has to continue to find removal answers every single turn, um, or, you know, at the expense of building his own endgame engine. Um, let's see. I'll we'll use that Cusco, I think, on his own item to increase his inkwell. So we'll check that. Yeah, that's exactly what he did. And that's a, it's a fun play. Um, it's, it's not the way you intuitively think about, you know, using Cusco. Usually you think about using it for, to remove your opponent's items. But here, trying to ramp again, I think that got him to seven ink. Uh, I think it did, yes. So uh, now he has the ink he needs to play that Be Prepared if he has it in hand uh, without having to ink anything else. But the versatility of this card, because just like you're saying, Liam, like, you don't intuitively think, oh, I can use this on my own stuff, my own locations, my own items to increase my ink. But we see that Jeremy using it very effectively here to protect the cards in his hands that are very viable answers to whatever Aaron's maybe putting out there, but also to get himself within Be Prepared range. And... We'll see kind of how that plays out for Jeremy here as Aaron is now left with one character left on the board in that Robin Hood champion of Sherwood. Again, we want to thank you all so much for tuning in here today at 20 Lore Pro and for Game Castle for allowing us to be here to be able to stream today's tournament for their Lorcana 1K. If you've missed any of today's rounds or today's game and you'd like to rewatch it later on, Head on over to 20 Lore Pro's YouTube, where we'll have all of today's rounds available for you to watch. Yeah, I just want one more plug for these small tournaments too, and, and the service that you know 20 Lore is doing here, you know, by streaming some of these smaller events. You know, these smaller, you know, 1Ks or even box tournaments at local game stores or league nights, this is where meta decks get their start. Um, there, you can test all you want, you know, online and using various means, but there's very few substitutes for sitting down against perhaps strangers who've never seen your deck before, um, playing them for the first time and kind of figuring out what you need to tweak uh, in a live, in-person setting. And so there's a lot of competitive players. For example, Aaron Rubin, who we know is playing in uh, Vegas. Um, we have some other Vegas players here too today. Um, they're probably here trying to get an idea of the meta, getting some practice, but also testing out some different lines and different cards, which they might not normally play. So um, there's a lot of value to watching all these these local streams and seeing players that you and, and games you might not normally see on some of the bigger streams. Um, so it's a lot of fun. I also really enjoy like the Lorcana Bros, seeing teams of just friends come together, they play tests, they get ready for these tournaments together as a group and have that good camaraderie together to kind of build up the type of decks that they want to play. It's really cool to see as we see Aaron here today playing and we saw his friend Adrian, also another Lorcana bro on stream earlier in one of the rounds who tested and plays regularly with Aaron, both of them doing well here today. And here's, here is a card that could be one of the engines of this deck. This is a card which we saw um, I think a lot in set three, uh, there was a there was a version of this deck that was pretty popular, this Beast Relentless deck. Um, what this is trying to do, uh, Be Re Beast Relentless card that says whenever an opposing character is damaged, you may ready this character. Um, it doesn't say you can't quest. It doesn't say you can't do anything. It just says ready this character. And so this allows you to quest, uh, deal damage to an opponent's character, quest again, deal damage to an opponent's character. And these steel decks, which run a lot of targeted damage actions, can benefit from this. Uh, so you can quest with Beast for sometimes, you know, four, six, eight lore in a single turn. Um, and uh, I'm willing to bet that we're gonna see Aaron, let's see if we see him use this Beast here in that way, because he could have game on board if he has a damage action in hand. Yeah, being at 19 lore already, even with Jeremy having this Lucky Dime and this Tamatoa, we're gonna have to find some ways on Jeremy's side to really clear everything and prevent him from coming back because right now this is very tight playing that Jeremy's gonna have to really showcase in order to keep himself in this game. And this deck can, unfortunately, doesn't have what he needs. Um, and we see him handshake there and scoop. Um, you know, these decks, anything with a Lucky Dime and especially anything with Ruby, um, Lucky Dime gives you the ability to get, you know, 15, 20 lore in a single turn. In Toronto, we saw a player on stream get 17 lore in a single turn. 
And then Ruby allows you to control the board with cards like Be Prepared and Brawl and Sisu and all that. So these Ruby Sapphire decks in the scenario that we saw them in are perfectly capable of gaining control of the board and then just not allowing their opponent to do anything. Unfortunately, you need certain pieces to do that. You need the card draw especially and you need you know the ink in your inkwell. And I think for this Ruby Sapphire player, for Jeremy here, um, he, both games, didn't quite have the ideal opening hand, um, had a couple cards he needed in the early game. And then, of course, Aaron putting on the consistent pressure and managing to pick, you know, certain cards with the Ursula Deceiver just never allowed him to get his entire game plan going. Um, so unfortunate there for him, uh, but interesting to see what Aaron's Emerald Steel deck could do, just applying a ton of pressure in the early in the mid game with these big body high lord characters with those smees and then having that beast relentless there as a closer um it's an interesting build and i'm excited to see how it does the rest of the day well thank you all so much for joining us here today at the game castle for their lorcana 1k we're here with 20 lore pro and liam thank you so much for joining us here for round four really appreciate it and if y'all are watching at home and you miss any of the rounds you can head on over to our 20 lore pro youtube earlier on this week and we will have those available for you thank you for tuning in and we will be back shortly here for round five <laughs>